Hello, my name is Caitlin Albright. I am here today with Dr. Ross McQuivy, an OBGYN from Stanford University. We will be discussing vacuum assisted delivery technique. Dr. McQuivy, Dr. Vaca and yourself stress the importance of the flexion point in cup application. Where exactly is the flexion point? The flexion point is defined as three centimeters forward of the posterior fontanelle along the sagittal suture. What are the indications for vacuum assisted delivery? There are three classic indications for a vacuum assisted delivery. The first being a prolonged second stage of labor. The second being a non reassuring fetal heart tracing or potential for fetal compromise. And the last for the maternal benefit, most often maternal exhaustion. With that in mind, what are the contraindications? The contraindications include gestational age. Most people in the worldwide literature recognize that 36 weeks and above is safe for a vacuum assisted delivery. There's some literature that goes to 34 weeks, so 34 to 36 seems to be a bit of a gray zone. It's my personal preference to stay at 36 weeks and above. Other contraindications that are included are bone demineralization disorders and bleeding disorders that are known to the fetus. A non completely dilated cervix, a baby who is not engaged in the pelvis or is a bit above a mid-station. And last but not least, and most importantly, unknown position of the fetal head at the time of delivery. With a mid-pelvic delivery, what angle should the pull be directed? Axis subtraction is of utmost importance when, uh, when conducting a vacuum delivery. It's important for physicians to understand that although the start of the pull may begin towards the floor when the baby is in a mid-pelvis, as the baby progresses further down in the pelvis, the axis of traction will change and become almost parallel, just slightly above parallel to the ground, just as the baby crowns in, at the outlet. Is there ever a situation when an oblique angle of traction is appropriate? No. An oblique angle or a rotational force on the cup is never appropriate for a vacuum. There are times where physicians feel that because the baby is asynclitic or oblique, that an oblique angle will help realign the fetal head with the maternal pelvis. But we may, must keep in mind that most important is we get the cup over the flexion point and only pull along the axis of the pelvis, which is never in an oblique or rotary force. Is it true that one cannot really apply too much pressure as a pop-off will occur preventing fetal injury? Now, that's a common misheld belief of vacuum, that if someone applies too much force to it, that it will inadvertently come off the fetal scalp. We know that any sort of pop-off or detachment increases the rate of complications associated with the baby. The emissary veins that support the scalp originate in the brain of the baby, so it's important that we don't provide excess traction and then a sort of violent detachment that causes or that occurs when the vacuum comes off the fetal scalp. What do you believe is the single most important contributor to fetal complications from vacuum delivery? The single biggest contributor to complications associated with vacuum is a misplaced cup. As we mentioned before, it's utmost important that we get the cup over the flexion point. If the cup is placed three centimeters forward of the posterior fontanelle along the sagittal suture, it decreases the diameters of the fetal head to present to maternal pelvis. Thus, when the delivery is conducted, the least amount of force is used. How can pop-offs be best avoided? There are three techniques that can be used to decrease your pop-offs. Number one is proper placement over the flexion point. The second is using a non-pulling hand. The thumb should be placed on the back of the cup and the finger directly on the scalp. As traction is applied, the thumb provides counter traction to the cup itself and the finger monitors this junction between the cup and the scalp, decreasing our chances of unwanted and in inadvertent pop-offs. The last is pulling in the axis of the pelvis, which we've already described, and not getting in a hurry to pull up too soon. How many pop-offs are too many? It's a widely held belief that three pop-offs are safe for a vacuum delivery. It's my personal opinion that no pop-off is safe and thus should be avoided as best we can during the procedure. If it comes off once, I encourage people to stop and reassess why the cup may have come off. If it comes off a second time, I encourage people to abandon the procedure and move on to something else. What is the three-pull rule? 
The three pole rule has been long established. It was first established with forceps and operative vaginal deliveries. The first pole is to conduct flexion and descent of the fetal head. The second pole is the head should be on the pelvic floor. The third being that the baby is delivered or imminent. The problem is people interpret imminent differently. My interpretation of imminent is complete perineal distension. Um, at that point, a fourth pole will most likely cause delivery of the fetal head. If it does not, adding a fifth or sixth pole just increases our chances of serious complications associated with these deliveries. How should these poles be counted during the delivery? Poles should be accounted according to the contraction, not the maternal effort. So it's important to understand with the mothers today who have so many epidurals, that oftentimes they will give an effort for 10 or 12 seconds, and stop to take a breath, thus we stop our polling efforts. Then they begin pushing again. As they begin pushing, I'll begin polling. But as long as that's within one contraction, that's still considered one pull and should not be counted as two. What are your recommendations in terms of reducing vacuum pressure between contractions? Outside of North America, they've never decreased pressure in between contractions. The idea was the less vacuum to the fetal head, less chance of causing injury. There's actually been only one randomized controlled trial that looked at decreasing pressure between contractions. And the results showed that there was no difference between those with maintained vacuum and those who decreased pressure in between. So it has now become my practice not to decrease pressure between contractions. Some have reported vacuum is associated with a higher failure rate compared to forceps. Do you think this is technique related? I think it is definitely technique related. I think it is directly attributed to technique. For many years, vacuum was thought to fail at a greater rate than forceps. And oftentimes that was because the concentration in true technique was focused on forceps. As forceps has fallen to the wayside and more and more people are using vacuum, we're seeing people using it more correctly. And that has increased the rate. In fact, the most recent literature using the vacuum and a maneuverable vacuum that allows you to get it on the flexion point shows a failure rate similar to what was originally reported by forceps. So when would forceps be a better choice? When used appropriately, the vacuum can be used in every indication that the forceps are used with two unique and rare situations. The first being when there's a breech delivery and there's an after coming head. There are specially designed forceps called Piper forceps that can be used. The vacuum could not be used at that point. The second is in a rare situation where you get a face presentation. And the vacuum obviously cannot be applied to the flexion point when the baby is in that type of presentation in the pelvis and thus should be avoided and forceps have been used to deliver that type of infant. Thank you Dr. McQuivy for joining me today in discussing vacuum assisted delivery techniques. You're welcome and thank you.